to the program of Hands-On Left Nears for Motor and Auditory Research. My name is Mariana Ceci, and I will be your host for this lecture. This event was brought to you by the Santos Dumont Institute, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, the State University of Campinas, the University of São Paulo, the Federal University of ABC, Brain Support, and RX Medical Technologies. Today, we are going to listen to the lecture of Mrs. Maria Delia Ratanha, who is an electrical engineer with a master's degree in neuroengineering obtained from the Santos Dumont Institute and a PhD in neuroscience obtained from Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein. During her PhD, Mrs. Aratanha has developed researches about the use of FNIRS to study GAIT and cognitive processing in people with multiple sclerosis. She currently works as a scientific consultant team lead at RX Medical Technologies. Please let us all welcome Mrs. Aratanha. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much for the invite to talk today. So usually this uh, lecture comes first in an FNIRS course. So we usually give, a, give an introduction about the technique and about uh, what are you measuring, what's there. But this, this course was decided to do backwards. So we showed you a lot about the research that can be done with FNIRS and we show how all of the applications and all of uh, different techniques for analysis. And now uh, I'm going to wrap up a little bit talking about what's the technique and what you're looking at. Uh, Professor uh, Rickson Mesquita today in the morning already talked a little bit about that. And I will just um, show you a little bit more. So starting, uh, where, where does this technique comes from? So if you look at the, the timing, 1929, it also starts near to the EEG uh, research, MRI research. So it's all, uh, all this neuroscience, neuroimaging research start very close in time. They develop different during the, because of uh, technology, but that's uh, very close. So uh, Dr. Cutler in 29 started to <clears throat> use visible light to look at uh, breast tumors. So just got a very strong light, go through the, the breast and saw where the light was absorbed to find uh, <clears throat> the tumor. Uh, in the 40s then, Glenn Millikan starts uh, to do experiments with near, in the near infrared uh, spe spectrum. Uh, spectrum. So <clears throat> these experiments were looking at uh, the activity, the oxygenation from muscle and cardiac uh, muscle. So that's how it started to look at the near infrared. He noted that the near infrared was transparent. Uh, the, the bone and also part of the skin was transparent to the near infrared light, so you could see deeper tissues. In 77, then, uh, one of his students, Jobsis, started to do the first near infrared brain experiment. So he was looking at can we see some activity uh, in the brain from the light. So that's uh, one of the the where we start. And then in 93, I think Professor uh, Rickson also talked about this, was the first FNIRS publication. So using the light to see some function on the brain activity. Of course, this has increased in the past two, three decades. So first we would start only with a single channel. Now we have some multi-channel and even high density um, FNIRS. And so that's just to bring a little bit about uh, the history of FNIRS. Here's the an interesting paper if you want to know more about it. Uh, I definitely recommend the read. So what, what is FNIRS? So I, I also like to start with just what does all of these um, letters here mean, right? So functional near infrared spectroscopy. It's just a form, functional optical imaging that you can use to measure uh, cortical hemodynamics. But what is then uh, spectroscopy? So let's start backwards, right? So what is spectroscopy? It's just a study of interaction of light with the matter. It's very, it's widely used for chemistry, physics. It's very well known. And uh, like Professor Rickson talked in the morning, usually have a light source here and a detector on the other side and a medium where with the absorption of the light here, you have an idea about the concentration of the molecule that's in there, in this medium here. So that's the main idea for the FNIRS. You have a light source, you have a medium, and then you have a detector on the other side. So these are the three 
main components uh, for this technique. And here, it's also the beer Lambert law where, where we saw in the morning. Um, and why in near infrared? Why this specific wavelength? So, <clears throat> interesting enough, the melanin absorbs the light below 700 nanometers and above 900 nanometers, mostly fat and water are the observers of this light. However, there is a therapeutic window be between 700 and 900 nanometers where hemoglobin is the most absorber of this light. You can see here uh, this absorption spectra according to wavelengths, and you can really see that in this um, window, the most observers are um, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. Here it's a little bit more clear. You can see that even you can differentiate them according to specific wavelengths that you that you um, choose. And according to the beer lambert law, if I have the intensity that I know I put in there, and I have the intensity, the intensity that I put in there, the intensity I measured, I will know the concentration of the molecules in there. So that's the, the principle. But why? Why the hemoglobin is very is so important? It's because of the neurovascular coupling, right? That Professor Ricks and explore a little bit more in the morning. Uh, so mainly we have uh, some neuronal activity, we have consumption of, of oxygen to the metabolism, and also an increase of the cerebral blood flow to that same area. This would then uh, end up, come up, in an increase of the oxyhemoglobin and a decrease of the deoxy. So this is what we expect as a hemodynamic uh, response function. So have some activity, and then it will up to this function, which is also called the bold signal, which is what we see in the uh, fMRI as well. In the fMRI, of course, um, we look more into the deoxy. We look at a proportion of oxy and deoxy hemoglobin. Here with the fNIRs, we can actually see different time series for both of them. Here is just a comparison between the um, fMRI and the fNIRs. There are several studies, so the first decade of FMIRS was mainly several studies uh, trying to correlate. Is this what I see in fMRI? It's really correlated. Is Can I see this in the FMIRS? So that was the, the main studies in 10 years. Now this, this is already a consensus. And um, we have been more to the applications, as you saw during this uh, workshop. So the hemodynamic response function is usually characterized for a stimuli here. Then there is a period where you need for your oxygen to reach the recruited area, which is around six seconds after your after a stimuli. That's very important to understand, especially when you are making your design of experiments. So if you come from a fMRI field, that's very um, uh, you're used to this already, but from the EEG field, for example, usually your response will be mainly uh, immediate after your stimuli. So that's very important to keep in mind. Of course, this is the expected signal. The real signal that you will see is most more likely lo lo looks like this one here in your in your right side. So we will see some of, of the noise and peaks, but in the end, a mean you will see some um, increasing deoxy decrease in the increased oxygen decrease in the deoxy hemoglobin. Here is just regular finger tapping experiment. So just to keep this in mind again, so what are we measuring with FMIRS, right? What, what, what are we seeing there? So spectroscopy, concentration of molecules, with the near infrared part, we are looking at the best window for hemoglobin absorption. So we are seeing oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, and total hemoglobin, which is the sum of them, also looking at the blood flow. And functional because it's a relative change due to a specific task, so mainly the bulk signal. But of course, um, 
looking back experiment, experiments in the 1900s, for example, we were not looking at the brain. So the Beer-Lambert law, it's actually used for just a becker with some molecules that you're looking at. When you put this into the brain, you have to think about the interaction with the tissue. And that's also what uh, Professor Rickson was talking uh, a lot in the morning, that when you have a light source here, you have a, a lot of uh, scattering, diffusion, absorption occurring here in the brain that we don't know exactly what it is. And only a portion of the signal, 5 to 6%, is what you're detecting on the other side. All of the other things that are happening here could be uh, due to just uh, some scattering, due to absorption, due to some systemic activity, some um, related to your experiment. So all of this you have to understand when you are designing your, your experiment and when you are thinking about FNIRS. So this is what happens uh, in the brain. So the light source comes from here. It comes from all directions here, and it, there is uh, some estimate of how this light will travel into the brain. The estimate, the mean of this uh, light path, it's called then the photon banana shape. So it looks like a banana from the light source to the detector part. So this main um, statistically mean of the, of the light path, it's then what you're looking at in the FNIR signal. It's important to understand that this is an exponential uh, curve. So as soon as you separate more the light and source detector, this um, light path would exponentially decay. There is uh, some papers showing that, and this is also uh, how we program and understand how to place your optics. So this is something we talk in the fold in the morning, I, I guess, both Professor Riggs and Professor Sato talked about this as well. So that's the depth of your, the measurement depends on the spacing for light and detector. So this is just something that we, we have to address as well. So this is the modified Beer-Lambert law. So the Beer-Lambert law was not intended to be used in, a, in the brain, for example, and we need to include the scattering, the absorption, all of this, the geometry of the head, which is not, the light path would not be straight as it was in a, just a backer, for example. So we need to take care of these other um, correction factors for the Beer-Lambert law. So we usually use the differential path length factor to, uh, to, to take into account the, the light path that goes into your skull. So it's usually not straight like this. It's going to take... Uh, going to really travel around your, around your brain. And this is just the length uh, between the source and the detector. This is the geometry, which is the effect of the, the scattering around your, your skull. And this, with this technique, we cannot determine this effect, specifically with this continuous wave F nears. So usually we take, that's uh, how we measure, we take the derivative between two time points to eliminate this effect here. But one limitation is then that you can only see the concentration changes relative to a previous state. So with this type of uh, FNIRS, we're not measuring absolute value of the oxygenation at that time point. You're measuring the, uh, the concentration, the relative changes um, in a certain time point. That's also important to know. And... Um, Going back to the optode arrangements then, there are different ways you can arrange your, your optode. So you can arrange them in all the same spacing, but you can also um, arrange them in high density. So with a lot of different sources and detector um, spacing between them. And usually this, it's something that you can call topography or tomography FNIRS. So the topography of FNIRS, it's the, the FNIRS that's the most used. And it's a fixed distance. So you can see here it's a map with a fixed distance of usually three centimeters uh, for adults, important to say. So usually two to three centimeters, you will see more or less one and a half centimeter to the cortex. And you space all your 
sources and detectors like this. This will give you a functional neuroimaging, uh, a map without any depth discrimination. However, if you want to look at the, what we call tomography, you can use multi-distancing. So you can do sources and detectors in varying distances. Please uh, just keep in mind that this doesn't mean that if I put like eight centimeters, five centimeters, I can go into deeper structure into the brain because if you put the source in the detector very far away, your light will go into the into your skull and it will sketch, be scattered and absorb, and you won't see anything on the detector side. It will be just noise. So the highest depth usually it's three centimeters, but you can see the light traveling through these first uh, layers of the skull. So that gives you more um, more precision, eliminates more variability from your signal. It's something that's being um, right now <clears throat> studied by a lot of um, um, neuroscientists, so high density. <clears throat> but one interesting fact of these differences of, uh, of um, spacing between sources and detectors, it's one thing that was already mentioned here in this workshop, but which is called the short channel. So when the light passes through the long channel, which is the source and the detector, three centimeters apart, you're actually getting all to this light path. So you get the activity from your extracerebral part, from your cerebral part, until the detector on this side. And um, this, it's actually not what we want to see. So we would like to see only the, the cortical part, right? So one idea that came from this a hardware way to take out this um, non-intended data, it's to use a channel, a detector, very close to the source. So you can use a short channel here. And this channel, what happens here is that the light will not travel that deep into the brain because the detector is already here. So the light path, the banana shape will be very very um, shallow into the brain. So this means that now you have a time series that has all your components, all your noise, and you have a time series that has just the extra cerebral activity. And then you can use this as a regressor. You can use this to clean your data later on. Um, the ideal separation, and you can see in this paper, but also in the paper that was um, published last year for from the mainly all the research from the Society of FNIRS, which is a paper that I also recommend, best practices in FNIRS. Um, they say the ideal distance is about eight millimeters, it needs to be less than one centimeter, uh, to really um, make sure you're not getting any part of your cortical activity. Because if you have any correlation, then it will be, of course, you cannot use this as a, as a regressor to be uh, harder. Um, and for adults, for infants, because they have a thinner skull, usually, um, <clears throat> it's about two millimeters to close. So for this uh, separation, there are already several uh, solutions, already several commercial solutions. But for this one, uh, it's still, um, that's, there is no commercial solution yet. There are a lot of uh, infant researchers that still use eight separation, eight millimeter separation, for example. So just to recap a little bit on the terminology, I'd like to, to recap this part so we, we understand what we are talking about. So for the probes, the probes uh, in FNIRS means the optodes. So what's taking light and, and detecting the light into your brain. So you have the light sources, the light detector, and each source detector pair forms then a channel. So one source and detector here, this will form one channel. It's different from the EEG part, for example, where one electrode is actually one channel. So here it's always uh, interesting to understand that. And what, what, what this FNIRS is actually measuring, right? So the raw signal in FNIRS, it's just voltage changes. It's the light intensity changes. So you are shining light into the brain, and your detector is measuring some level of difference in there. This is the raw uh, change. 
the raw uh, signature. With the raw signal, with the light intensities, and then apply the Beer Lambert law and get to your relative hemoglobin change. And the application of the Beer Lambert law will depend uh, on your population, will depend on the age, will depend on your on your experiment. So that's the that's uh, something interesting to think about. And then you will transform this into functional data, which means then you will uh, look this data with your design of experiment. Um, okay. Uh, so the F near signal, we talk a bit about, but I really like this um, representative uh, figure here, which shows exactly what we're measuring. So the F near signal, it's then a sum of the neurometabolic coupling, which we want to see, so the neurovascular coupling, what we're expecting, but it also has all the cerebral blood flow of the evoked changes that we're not expecting, and also extra cerebral activity from evoked, evoked changes that we're not expecting. Those changes can either be correlated or not to your design of experiment. So there, this is something you need to control and understand during your experiment. Um, one idea that Mr. Rickson talked about, for example, in Pato as well, uh, using accelerometers, so you can quantify the movement of the head, for example, or you can use <coughs> EMGs or heart rate vari variability to understand these two components here and how they relate and how I can clean the, the data that I'm really interested in, the data that I've my whole experiment around. Uh, just to illustrate a bit, some of the extracerebral components, some of the components that are there, but they are <coughs> um, noise in your data, could be the cardiac frequency, for example, this high, high um, frequency here, this uh, ripples on your data, could be also some respiratory or microwave systemic data, which would be a little bit slower, some like blood pressure fluctuations, as uh, Professor Rickson showed in the first you know, lecture of the morning, some correlation with blood pressure and the cerebral activity. So choose carefully your experimental design frequency. <clears throat> For example, if you admire waves, we know it's about 10 hertz. So we try to do the experimental design that does not correlate with this exact frequency to make it easier to separate it. Um, one important thing when we do uh, any experiment, actually, it's to understand the challenges and limitations of the technique. So we talked a little bit about the signal, but there are also some challenges that are not related directly to the signal. So first, the, the light source. So we already know that just about 6% of the, of the signal is what you're actually measuring, and the light is severely um, attenuated from the source to the detector part. Uh, one of the things that why this happens, it's uh, the penetration of the light in the skull. So here in this paper, there was, they did some um, um, measure, not measurements, some, um, um, they, they did some um, Monte Carlo simulation here, some simulations to show the thickness of the skull correlated to the, the light in uh, different parts of the brain. So you have here uh, the cerebral blood flow in the prefrontal area that it's thicker than, for example, that's thinner than, for example, in the motor area or occipital area. So it is easier to get data from the prefrontal area for two reasons. It's thinner and also usually we don't have hair on this part. And here is the second blocker of the light um, in an FNIRS experiment. If you have tried to do some FNIRS already, you already know these two conditions here. Um, in a reality, what does, mean, what does this mean? It's for a uh, participant that has um, more hair or um, a thicker hair, you will need to have more time to prepare that by a participant. But with the proper light source, you will be able to get signal anyway. 
The second uh, part is, of course, the detector part, right? So there are several types of detectors out there and several ways to use these detectors. And the sensitivity of the detector will also influence if you need a better coupling of the source or, or not. So the higher a sensitivity of the detector, of course, the better. So we, uh, you have here the SIPD detectors, for example, which is um, usually very good, but there are also APD detectors, it's avalanche photodiodes. So with less light, you have more um, intensity, you have a higher sensitivity. And uh, not uh, directly the case here, but you saw that you can combine this with fMRI and with fMRI or TMS, you usually have to use fibers, optic fibers, and not the electric cables, electric um, sources and detectors that uh, you have here in the institution. So just as a reminder, um, if you're using uh, optical fibers, it's important to understand that when you detect the signal on the other side, each meter will reduce the signal by 5%. And of course, um, to get, I have the, the detector, I have the source, the medium, but how do I put everything there, right? So that's another important thing of the FNIRS technique. How do I put all these sources and detectors on the head? And why, the, why this is influences? So <clears throat> the probe, uh, it's, it's very important that the probe easily penetrates into the head and it's easy to to get the signal in there. So for example, for babies or neonates that they don't have hair usually, and they have a very thin skin, usually you should go for a blunt tip, for example, or very carefully not get any tip from the other side of the cap. For someone who has a hair like mine, for example, which would be more challenging as an F near subject, you would need some kind of probe like this that can comb the hair and take the hair out. So these are some of the small things that can help when you are doing your FNIRS experiment. And of course, uh, it's also always important to have enough probes to cover your region. This is very similar to an EEG uh, type of thinking. So you need to have enough coverage on your region of, exp of uh, interest. One other thing that blocks the FNIRS, um, that it's important to understand, it's the environmental light. So usually on the light of a lab or you know, house light or inside of a hospital, this will be uh, mostly fine. You will be able to capture the FNIRS signal. But if you want to go out in the park with this very, um, very bright sun, especially here, you will definitely see some noise in your data. And environmental noise, because of course the sunlight and this also the visible light, it includes the near infrared uh, spectrum as well. So you should use an overcap just to block the light. Um, in my case, for example, I I did some experiments with in the gate lab with some um, infrared cameras to get the the link movement. So this infrared was also interfering with my FNIRS data. So I had to use like this aluminum foil caps that helped to reflect this data. So this is uh, small tips for design of ex for the experiment itself. Of course, cap fit and size. So as already talked uh, about the, the probes needs need to be on the exact position that you want. So you can measure from the brain area that you were expecting. And the way this, this uh, equipment is designed, you use the 1020 system, what cap in the 1020 system, which is the same as an EEG cap. And it's important to have the correct head circumference so you can properly place the cap. All of those, those things will help to control some of the variability in your signal. <clears throat> And the third one, uh, it's then the movement itself. So the movement from the optodes on your skull. So usually if this source or detector move a little bit, you will have some of the spikes in your data, right? And there's a second one, which is also the baseline change, 
was also talked in the morning, if this uh, there is some light going in here, your detector, the baseline will have a shift during your, your experiment. So these are the two um, movement-related noise that you can uh, avoid by proper cab cabling, proper head fit, and um, movement control. Um, of course, just to wrap up, it's not all <laughs> it's bad. So there's a lot of uh, good things uh, about the FNIR. So some of the strengths why you should you know, use FNIRs. Uh, mainly, it's very flexible, topically safe. So that's um, if, especially people that work with kids, that kind of bring something uh, to, the, to, the, to the eye or to the skin. It's safe. And then, uh, of course, subject comfort setup. You're used to EG, for example, there's no gel that usually helps with the participant happiness as well. And it's suitable for a lot of uh, different populations. So, Kids that you cannot put inside the MRI, for example, you can definitely apply uh, the FNIRs. <clears throat> it's also portable. Here you can see two people playing uh, chess in, in transport. So you can just get the, the small amplifier take outside, take to the patient home, take to the hospital. That's uh, also very interesting. And of course, the, the third thing is then the multimodal integration. So because it's an optical technique, and most of the imaging techniques that are there are magnetic or electric. They don't have any um, interaction if properly placed. Um, so <clears throat> typically, you can integrate with EEG, TMS, eye tracking, motion capture. Of course, you need to understand all the limitations of all the techniques and understand um, <clears throat> how to integrate them. But it's definitely possible. You can see here some probes. So this is the a fiber optic probe inside an MRI. And here you can see the EEG cap with the with an F -mirs. Um And this brings a lot of uh, different types of applications. I have a, a video here. I don't know if it will play, but we can try. Just talking about some applications. This was done in the UFABC, Professor Sasser. Also the experiment he talked earlier today. This was done in Berlin. The cat is here for this movie. Also in Berlin. This is uh, one colleague in cardio training. Also, table tennis from Professor Sato. Violin Duetto, which also experiment from Professor Sato. This was done in Russia, in a meditation experiment. And then with the European Festival. Uh, Professor Frederick Bichet does a lot of workloads and pilots. And this is a high density cap. Integrated cap. So that's what I have to talk to you today. So how do we get to the technique? How do you apply the technique? All, all the limitations. And also um, some cool applications that we have out there. Um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.